after the major earthquake that struck southwest China earlier this week, we'll be talking about how China mobilizes and coordinates to help people cope with the unthinkable. And with this year's Hugo Awards about to get underway to choose the best science fiction writer of the year, we talked to last year's winner, who was the first female Chinese author to win this most coveted prize. Welcome to The Point, live from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. The death toll is still rising after a magnitude 7 earthquake on Tuesday night hit the scenic area of Zhou Jai Go in southwest China's Sichuan province. Tens of thousands of tourists were trapped and the mountainous landscape has been hampering relief and rescue work. But everything seems to be going smoothly. Members of the People's Liberation Army, firefighters, police, medical groups and volunteers have been mobilized to deal with the aftermath and resources are being sent to the most needed areas. Some say that China has become more professional in disaster relief and crisis management, something gained from the painful memories of previous earthquakes, such as the Wenchuan earthquake in 2008. So how does China mobilize its resources and organize its rescue work for disasters? Joining me in the studio today is Gwendolyn Pan, head of the International Federation of the Red Cross East Asia Regional Office, and Professor Fu Jing at Peking University. But first, let's cross over to our reporter Wu Guoxiu, who is standing by in Sichuan for the very latest. Guoxiu, thank you very much for bringing us the latest since uh, earlier today. Now, how is the rescue and settlement work going? Good evening, Liu Xin. Uh, this is the major road to the epicenter. You may constantly f uh, see some vehicles passing by. They're mostly uh, relief or disaster relief vehicles. By 1 p.m. today, the disaster has killed 20 people and injured 431. Over 60,000 tourists and migrant workers have been evacuated from the region and um, the power the electricity is basically restored but only two lines are still being repaired but phone signal is basically found there and over uh, 20,000 local people have been moved to safer places uh, specialists are also detecting secondary disasters near the Jojago area and they have found over 250 areas potentially hazardous and they have drawn up a uh, routes for hedging in these areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Guoxiu, as more people from the earthquake area have been rescued mm -hmm. and resettled, the National Earthquake Response Support Service is sending light helicopters with uh, experts, medicine and mm -hmm. relief groups, uh, relief, relief goods to Zhou Jago. From what yeah. you have seen, what are the most difficult part of the mm -hmm. process and how people are coping with it? I think the biggest challenge is first of all aftershock. Actually three hours ago when I just got here I was surprised by a very big one, 4.1 magnitude aftershock and when I was observing the water in the bottle it was almost never still. It's recorded over 1,700 aftershocks after the earthquake. So this, these aftershocks are causing landslides, uh, challenges to this uh, relief effort. Also, I was uh, talking about landslides. Some roads in the national parks are still being blocked. So there might be still some people being trapped there. Uh, also, very sadly, we were told that over 1,000 people are still choosing to stay at their home. So local governments are trying to persuade them one by one, home, family by family, to tell them to leave their beautiful homes temporarily for a safe, uh, for the, the safety concern. So Lucian, at this moment, uh, just now I met some people from Beijing and directly I followed them from Chengdu to Zhujiago uh, to rescue. They were from social groups. Uh, I was told that over 30 uh, social groups, uh, rescue uh, or, or still are also here joining the government efforts to help with the uh, government uh, disaster relief. So we have to give thumbs up to all these people briefly uh, donating their efforts to the relief efforts. Thank you very much, Guo Xiu, for bringing us live from Sichuan. And uh, let's uh, come to our study discussion. Welcome to the discussion, Guan and Professor Fu. Professor Fu, let me start from you because you 
you were with me, we were talking about the 2008 Wenchuan earthquake. I remember very well. What have you noticed in terms of recognition of this disaster uh, that is different between 2008 and now? Well, the first circle of uh, a crisis uh, management is uh, recognition, and this time uh, in that place, China had put in the play uh, a system called uh, pre-warning system. I used uh, pre uh, pre very uh, cautiously because it's not really a system of forecasting of earthquake. It's uh, the system is taking advantage of the difference in terms of a traveling time between quick wave and electronic. Uh, wave. The latter, of course, travels much faster than uh, the former, so yeah. that you yeah, can. Yeah, I've heard about these uh, applications, for instance, developed by the Chengdu Institute of Care Life, that they sent five messages from the Epic Center to users in nearby city of Chengdu within 20 seconds after yeah. the uh, initial uh, shock wave of the earthquake, and that is 70 seconds before the shock wave arrived in the city of Chengdu. Is that yeah, what we're talking that, about? That, that's the system I was talking about. How significant about. is that uh, in several well, people's lives? The time, the gap is very uh, short. Uh, we are talking about seconds, uh, but depending on the distance you are from the epicenter, uh, the farther away that you have more time. But if you say you gain one uh, minute, one minute uh, is the time that will make a life and a death uh, difference. Mm -hmm. Now, people have done simulation. Had China put in a system uh, in uh, the previous earthquake uh, in that place, near place, we would have saved up to. 20,000 people. So uh, 70 uh, seconds will make a huge difference. Yes. Uh, Gwen, what have you noticed that is remarkable or that is very different from what your experience in this field for many years, also in different countries in Asia? Uh, for instance, when the disaster struck, how did you coordinate it or cooperate it with the Chinese government mm -hmm. and the Chinese Red Cross? Well, uh, first, uh, Liu Xin, I would like to. Um, on behalf of the Red Cross, send our strength and courage to those people who are affected by the earthquake. Um, well, different co every country has different you know, way of working. So in China, what I have observed is that I'm very impressed with the speed, with the well-coordinated approach uh, on the response and rescue mechanism. Uh, the top-down mechanism is very helpful. So they follow one chain of command on what to do. So people are they follow certain, you know, rules, certain um, SOPs. You know, I, I should say that. And in in, in SOP the, meaning standard operating procedure. Okay. It's a it's an operating procedure where mm -hmm. people, you know, they know who has the responsibility for which level of disaster. You know, it may be. Example for earthquake, they follow four levels of. Uh, um, uh, uh, response, you know, for level, uh, the lowest level, the county level will respond, then next will be the regional level, provincial level, and the national level. So they know what exactly to do, then the government is able to coordinate as well, not just all the government entities, but also other NGOs, rescue organizations, how they come in and support and help. If you are not able to do that, it will be very chaotic. It will even pose a lot of challenges to the um, speed, you know, of the rescue and response effort. In this kind of situation, speed is the name of the game. But if there are too many people there, especially those untrained, yeah. those are not well coordinated, it will pose a lot of pressure, a lot of challenge to the whole rescue and response mechanism. I saw in China, it was smoothly done. Imagine the government and other organizations, even the travel agencies, was able to evacuate you know, uh, 60,000 people immediately out of the area. And then tents were set up, Chinese Red Cross was, able, was, was there, other uh, rescue teams. Uh, this is well coordinated. In some countries, when we're, you know, the, there's not much good system in place, all other agencies are just jumping, you know, and helping. This is a human nature. Yeah. This is what have you noticed as a different between what China was doing in 2008 and what China is doing now? Well, uh, Liu Xin, I wasn't here in the time, but what I know from what I've heard from the people I've uh, spoke with, um, it, it has a lot of changes. Example, technology, like what Professor was saying earlier. Technology helped a lot, you know, in saving lives. So this was not there in the, in the past. So technology is playing a big role now, and thanks to that. And we have to continue uh, investing in science and technology in order to save more lives in the future. Another thing that we saw in Chinese Red Cross in particular, at the time, they have no, uh, like, a 
professional system of uh, response. They have maybe medical uh, response system, but not the total one. In disaster, you cannot just focus on one area. Mm -hmm. You have to focus on the entire you know, rescue operation uh, and response operation. You have the rescue team, you have the relief team, you have the health team, you have he uh, water and sanitation and other themes yeah. that will be there simultaneously to work to help those who are in need. And they have to be coordinated. Yes, and in China now, because of that experience, because uh, the International Federation of the Red Cross came to support, Chinese Red Cross learned from there, they now have, they're the only organization in the country now, have this whole complete set of emergency response team. Yeah. And that came out from the experience of Wenchuan earthquake. Wow. Um, indeed, uh, painful memory, but uh, a lot of lessons learned from there. Professor mm -hmm. Fu, in terms of readiness, what is different between 2008 and this time? For instance, I remember back then, because of the bad roads, a lot of areas simply could not be reached. And just now we were talking about light helicopters being sent yep. to these areas. What difference is being made there? Well, the difference uh, between uh, now and then uh my observation is uh, in the previous earthquake, uh, uh, China tend to get uh, the different phases of uh, crisis management confused. For instance, when you recognize a uh, crisis coming, then you must be uh, ready. Uh, ready in terms of equipment that you have, uh, uh, how the equipment that you have to uh, repair the roads. And uh, the first phase, uh, uh, usually when you are ready, then you need to uh, respond in a very quick way. But then the last phase is the recovery. Mm -hmm. You do not confuse the last phase with uh, the previous phase of you response. You need to prioritize. You need to yeah. prioritize. And when you need volunteers, it's usually during the last phase of recovery. And when you confuse those uh, phases, then you get a lot of people. But then the stress is very uh, mm -hmm. high. So basically, so high. yeah. So basically, in terms of logistics, uh, it's been done better. Yeah, this time it's uh, it's a very orderly way. Uh, Recognition, we have improved uh, readiness. Uh, I do not see evidence that we are uh, in lack of uh, uh, medical equipment, uh, heavy equipment, uh, uh, transportation. And this time, what uh, make a huge difference uh, is that we have a fleet of helicopters because in those most difficult areas, usually the roads will be broken, will be collapsed, and you need to have uh, different forms of uh, airlifting. And yeah. this time, you see heli uh, helicopters. And also a very interesting thing that we notice is the orderly manner that people allow themselves mm -hmm. to be instructed to be evacuated. I mean, in terms of such a disaster, uh, you can imagine panic, for instance, or stampede, especially in mountainous roads, but it didn't really happen. Why was that? When? Well, uh, in my observation is that, number one, uh, disaster... Um, you know, has been the awareness has been raised globally, not just in China. So people are somehow aware of what to do. The number two, the past experience maybe of people who have been there, they know what to do next time. And then in disaster, you know, uh, safety and um, uh, safety and uh, disaster demand so much discipline and following the rules. If you want to get aid, then you have to follow rules. And then I think because the speed and fast response, people saw hope. They know that People they will get relaxed. aid. They, they, they relax. They yeah. feel so so relieved seeing the government there. Red Cross and other agencies there to help them. And then that calmed down the people. They were shocked, of course, at the very beginning, but they, when they saw this help, they got so relieved and then people were able to, you know, be disciplined and wait for their turn. Yeah, Professor Fu, a quick uh, remark here. I perhaps. very much uh, agree. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the other way also is evidenced by the fact that uh, uh, the level of awareness on the part of the public is uh, very much elevated. And if you look at the management of the road, and this time during the phase of uh, quick response, uh, uh, we have a better way to manage roads. Uh, mm -hmm. Private cars uh, were sort of uh, uh, asked to move away first, yeah. that uh, uh, the trucks by We prioritize, we manage things. better. But yeah. during the later phase, uh, probably uh, the volunteers yeah. will have a bigger role to play. Yeah, we have to leave it there. Thank you very much, Guan, head of the International Federation of Red Cross uh, East Asia Regional Office, and Professor Fu Jing from uh, Peking University. And uh, as usual, uh, my first point here, the Wenchuan earthquake in 2008, which killed around 90,000 people, was the most destructive disaster in China 
China in recent years. Since then, China's preparedness for natural disasters has been strengthened in many ways, although there is always room for improvement. As the world continues to fight uh, global warming, it's a sad fact that we uh, will be seeing more disasters in the years ahead. So officials and experts and the general public will continue to strive to understand how they can bolster and enable themselves to prepare for and respond to crises. Already there are efforts being made to educate the general public, such as the recently opened Museum of Earthquake Preparedness in Beijing's Olympic Park. Meanwhile, credit must also go to international humanitarian organizations such as the IFRC, who are ready to swing into action whenever a disaster occurs. The 75th World Science Fiction Convention is now being held in Helsinki. This uh, 75th Hugo Award, which is science fiction's most prestigious award, will be presented at the same time. Chinese science fiction writer Liu Cixin's work Death's End has been nominated for the best novel. Whatever the result, this time, two Chinese science fiction writers have won the award in the past two consecutive years. Has Chinese science fiction been gaining momentum as a result? What are the hurdles ahead and where do writers get their inspirations from? I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by the winner of the 2016 Hugo Award, Tao Jing Feng. Jing Feng, welcome to the studio today. Now, uh, Liu Cixin has been nominated again for the third volume of his book, The uh, three body problem the first volume made him and also um, gave him and also China's first Hugo Award what do you think are the chances of Mr. Liu winning again this year I think the uh, probability of winning is quite high uh, because uh, I've uh, read about some of those analysis of this year's nominations uh, perhaps there is only one uh, a uh, challenging uh, opponent of uh, Liu Cixin is uh, work by a uh, female writer of the United States. Uh, but I still think that uh, Liu Cixin's work, uh, the death uh, the death end is quite uh, competitive and I really love this book. Mm -hmm. Let's wait and see the result at the yeah. end of Friday. Uh, but again, having win this award yourself and also Liu Cixin winning this award before you, uh, what kind of influence, what kind of momentum do you think these events have given to Chinese science fiction writers and readers? I do uh, believe that uh, there is a rising uh, interest of Chinese works after uh, our winnings. Uh, several uh, foreign press uh, have offers to publish Chinese writers' works, not only my own works, but also other Chinese writers' works, like Chen Qiu Fan's and uh, uh, Bao Shu's and Xia Jia's works. Mm. All these uh, works uh, cost attention by the Western world, and I do believe that uh, it's a good phenomenon. We know that uh, um, Chinese writers have traditionally not been very known, let's say, for being imaginative fantasy writers. However, your book, as well as the the first volume of the Three Body Problem, have made Three Body Problem have made to the overseas market. For instance, uh, uh, former U.S. President Barack Obama or Mark Zuckerberg, they have been reading these and, um, you know, thinking. Chinese science fictions are quite appealing. What do you think are the special appeal of science fiction coming from China? Actually, I do think that Chinese people are imaginative. Uh, we are just uh, uh, writing as good works as the Western writers. I don't think that there is a so large a gap between Eastern and Western writers. But science fiction mm -hmm. are still 
kind of different from the kind of fantasy work that Chinese writers used to write. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, be perhaps because that uh, the science education is not that um, um, popular uh, before the 1980s. So, uh, because you know, science fiction it requires uh, the uh, education in science, uh, at least uh, some education mm -hmm. in science. So perhaps only uh, after the 1990s, then the science fiction in China began to prosper. Let's talk about your story, which is definitely very interesting, folding Beijing. And what I find it interesting is it actually didn't provide much future technology or aliens coming from outer space, but it's, really, it's a little bit of an extension from our reality, but with elements of imagination. And, uh, and some people are really saying that this is not science fiction. <laughs> what do you say to that? Actually, I do like to do those uh, cross-border uh, works. Uh, it's not uh, perhaps not pure science fiction. Uh, it's not pure literature as well. I, I do like to uh, just uh, do some kind of uh, experiment with uh, literature and with other things. And I, I think that with the science fiction element in in works, it can bring us uh, the different angles of our world, and I just love this kind of feeling. I just want to see our life uh, with another angle, and that's how I do literature uh, mm. experiments. Two things you talked about as future challenges for cities like Beijing. One is income inequality that are passing through generations, and the second is the possibility of AI uh, or even the reality of AI replacing mm. labor. Um, why do you think these two challenges are the ones we have to pay attention to? Actually, these two challenges intertwine with each other now, and because of the uh, threat by by AI taking uh, us uh, the, the jobs, uh, the income inequality will be enlarged in the future because perhaps a lot of people cannot find uh, 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 proper works. Uh, uh, Cannot, they, they are jobless. And with the, those engineering in AI sectors and also other uh, creative people, they, they may gain much more in the future. So then the income gap uh, may be enlarged. This is still a challenge faced by a lot of countries now. Mm -hmm. Now in this book, you said that in order to maintain social stability, the upper class or the privileged class decided to keep the underclass um, and among them many garbage collectors to, to keep this job um, taken by humans so that uh, they will have a basic living, right? They, they can make a living instead of being taken out by robots. What, but in reality, um, what would be the solution to the problem? It's a huge question, I know. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't think that uh, a separation will be a good uh, solution to this problem. I, I think that uh, folding Beijing is not a proper case to study because here. Because it's kind of like um, uh, escaping, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. the people don't yeah. interact, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They don't see the right. darker side or the brighter yeah. side. And actually, I think that uh, the social mobility itself might be a key to this problem because so when there's uh, social mobility there are uh, more jobs created in the process and so uh, uh, people can be educated in this process uh, to to be um, suitable for future works and also if there is uh, quite a good um, uh, liquidity in the society and then we can have uh, more and more new jobs. J.K. Rowling for instance spoke in her Harvard commencement address in 2008 and she said that imagination is not only a unique human capacity to envisage that which is not and is therefore the fount of all invention and innovation in its arguably most transformative and revelatory capacity, it is the power that enables us to empathize with humans whose experience we have never shared. How do you value imagination in creative writing and how do you nurture your imagination when you're writing? Yeah, I do think that uh, imagination is a really, really precious uh, value for human beings. At least uh, when we compare ourselves with uh, AI writers, we, we still think that uh, the imagination and the uh, ability to express one's imagination is really uh, uh, precious uh, capability of human, and I uh, 
I, I think that imagination uh, calls for some some, some kind of uh, um, ability to uh, uh, combine knowledge from different areas together because uh, new things happen when you just uh, uh, you, you cross the border of uh, knowledge and then you just uh, link uh, different things together yeah. and you studied physics for yeah. instance that's mm -hmm. your example and, and now you are a macroeconomics researcher so does that help you yes to because find inspiration? In, in physics eyes, uh, uh, we, we do have a view of this world. And uh, when I entered the field of uh, macroeconomics, I found that, oh, in macroeconomics uh, eyes, the world is uh, different, is another uh, scenario. And then when I compare these two stories, I found out, oh, there are some interesting uh, comparisons. Yeah. And then I, I got insights so when I just uh, yeah. uh, do these kind of comparisons. Can you find imagination or inspiration or they just come to you? Uh, I, I think that we all have a lot of imagination in our head. Uh, you and also the others, people, everybody has imagination. But so we uh, just a lot of people don't have the habit of put the imagination down to some works. We, we, we just let the imagination go. And uh, just dream about it and, yeah, and, and, and not, never and express it or yeah, write it down. Right. Yes. So we uh, this this year we created some summer camps for the for the children, for for them to uh, to write out about their imagination, mm -hmm. about their creative works, and we found out that uh, the children can write really good stories. They do have all, all those crazy ideas, and then uh, with some help of our teachers, they can. Uh, they can write them down and yeah. they can create uh, really mature works. And so, so we think that uh, everybody has the capability of uh, imagine, uh, but what we need is the habit of opportunity to uh, transfer our imagination into some real works. Mm -hmm. And the kids need to be encouraged. Yeah. Um, very interesting, you mentioned your work with these kids, now you have multiple identities. You are <laughs> a science fiction writer, a macroeconomics researcher, a mother, a contributor to these social programs. How do these multiple roles help you in your creation? I, I think that uh, uh, a writer needs the source of writing. Uh, I cannot just uh, sit in my room and uh, do all the writings. I need to uh, interact with the so, uh, society. I need to meet people, to observe people, to do things, and then I, I do have a lot of thinkings in this process. So I love my work. I love to work with children. I love to do those uh, social investigations. I like to listen to people's talking. And uh, sometime later, I don't know when, and some of those uh, pieces will come back to my mind and become some, some new materials in writing. So is there some new material uh, being created at this moment? What can we expect? Can we expect something? Uh, this year I will publish another book ab about AI, uh, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. I know that this topic is very hot this year and uh, I myself uh, love to read those books about artificial intelligence. Yeah. Looking forward to that book. Yeah, I hope and so. It will come out uh, in October this year. And all the very best to you. Thank you. Hao Jingfang, thank you very much for joining us today. Hao Jingfang, the 2016 winner of the prestigious Hugo Award. My last point, in a way, I'm also in a job where imagination is very much needed. When I talk about the earthquake in Sichuan or uh, armed conflict somewhere else in the world, I try to restructure reality with questions and answers and, in J.K. Rowling's words, empathize with humans whose experiences we have never shared. Then these discussions become relevant and meaningful, hopefully, for all of us. Let's imagine together. And that's all for this edition of The Point with me, Li Xin. As always, you can follow us on Twitter or visit our Facebook page using the handle The Point with Alex. Download the application called CGTN Live or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.